Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Evoke Ag. In this next 40 minutes, you're going to learn about a rather interesting pair of strange bedfellows, okay? Eden Brew has an audacious mission to put delicious dairy at the forefront of global food sustainability. And behind this startup is commercializing and scaling research from Syro and taking up the big challenges of our times. So how do we create enough protein to feed this growing population? Now, Jim Fader, I want to start with you, CEO of, of Eden Brew. Briefly set the scene. Who is Eden Brew and what's behind your story? So Eden Brew makes animal-free dairy milk and we use precision fermentation to do that. So think of it a little bit like brewing beer. You've got yeast, uh, you use that yeast to brew alcohol. Uh, and then that alcohol goes into a beer drink. Well, we actually brew dairy proteins by using yeast, uh, and then we take those dairy proteins out and combine them with other ingredients, and voila, you've got milk without the cow. But there's more to the Eat and Brew story, though, than, than meets the eye. So, like, it's a very fascinating group of partners at the core. So maybe set that scene as well and how you've got to this point. Well, so CSIRO, uh, um, are obviously an amazing science organisation, and one of their real strengths is dairy science. They've got over 120 years of dairy science, and they were doing a lot of research around dairy uh, proteins and, and how to brew them. And one of the critical parts of milk is the way the proteins combine and they create what's called a casein micelle. It's nature's way of making that that uh, ingredients or the nutrition in milk bioavailable to the baby. So CSIRO was studying that. Um, and then uh, I came along with, um, with Main Sequence Ventures, who are the, vent the Deep Tech Venture Fund, who have uh, seeded the business, and, uh, and Norco, who um, have uh, partnered and co-founded with Eden Brew to take the product to market. And so this is obviously where it gets interesting, because Michael, as CEO of Norco, well, firstly, there aren't that many dairy cooperatives left. I mean, Norco is the biggest. It's yeah. got a 125-year history. But also, you I mean, you've got some serious stake in this as well. I mean, 20 years yourself in the dairy industry, a country boy. So this almost seems like a counterintuitive relationship, right? That, that Norco would be a key partner on this. Or is that how you see it? No, I actually think it's quite, quite complimentary. I mean, if we have a look at our range of, of products in our portfolio, products that we take to the market, we certainly see the Eden Brew product as quite complementary. And you know, also, you know, it, um, it's going to be able to create value for our farmers, which we otherwise wouldn't have been able to get. So we've just been through a capital raise with Eden Brew. We've got an organisational valuation now of $60 million. We're a 25% carried free interest company, uh, uh, investor. So you know, that's, that's enabled a significant amount of value in that investment to grow. You know, as we, as we look to do this further, you know, there might be 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million litres of milk that, that uh, Eden Brew uh, look to address the market with. You know, that'll be bottled in our, in our manufacturing facilities, which will make our, our manufacturing facilities much more uh, efficient. And, and then, of course, you know, we're a 100% farmer-owned cooperative, so our mission is to make sure that we're providing value to our farmers. So if we save five cents a litre on our conversion costs through our factories, well, our farmers will most likely get five cents a litre more. And that's, that's a real tangible benefit that this particular um, collaboration with, with Main Sequence, with CSIRO and ourselves, you know, can go straight back into the hip pockets of, of hard-working Australian farmers. So Change isn't always easy, though, Michael. You're, you're making it sound like it was all rosy. <laughs> a little Google search will tell me that it wasn't all rosy. So you had the deal on the table. So firstly, you needed to be bold enough as the CEO to take this to the, your board. And it's a big deal, right? And then on the, a, on the ABC, on the radio, you had members suggesting that you should be sacked. There was even quite a colourful newspaper article. Let me read it to you. It might give you a little bit of... Um, PTSD, but let me just go for it for a moment. There's been some fierce opposition to what has been called an unholy alliance, with a former director saying he would be happy to share his learnings with sitting board members if they wished to walk the CEO to the door. And later in that same article, another Norco member said, Norco's core business is real milk. Any investment it makes should be in that, not supporting an industry effectively trying to displace us. So. How are the members now with the Unholy Alliance? 
uh, is, is, it, is it sort of um, more rosy, uh, people seeing this picture? And also, maybe describe that, because this is also a real consideration for all of us, mm. that often part of this is that there is heart, soul, sweat and tears. And so it's not always that people are completely adverse to change, but sometimes you have to take them on a journey. Mm. Well, the first thing I'd say to that, isn't it wonderful working with farmers? You get to, op you get to experience some fairly straight feedback, which is always, <laughs> always important in order to move forward. But I think certainly our journey, and look, taking a, a proposal to a board of six dairy farmer members that I'd like us to partner in a, in a non-dairy uh, milk uh, joint venture with CSIRA Main Sequence, you know, wasn't, a, wasn't an easy sort of decision, but... As we, as we put the paper together and what we we're going to do with this organisation, the value that we create, what are the benefits for our cooperative, I went through this big spiel at the board meeting and at the end of it they said, oh, Michael, you had us at a low. <laughs> um, so I think they were just doing that to make me sweat a little bit. But as, as we certainly look through the membership base, at, at the time, you know, there was, you know, there was some people that were very, very scared, felt threatened, and, and, and that's important. And, and some of those people, I probably don't think I'll be able to convince them that the benefits... Uh, the way that the way that we see it, but the majority were like, "Oh, Michael, you're bored. You know, this is an absolute masterstroke. You know, here we are. You know, we're now going to have a product in the marketplace that we're going to address a address a part of the market that we couldn't address before, and, and also we'll be making making money out of those people that uh, weren't looking to purchase our product. So that was that was important, and that was the majority. And then there's this. There's, a, there's an amount in the middle that we're sort of, oh, I'm not really sure what that's about and, you know, I've, I, I don't, don't understand. And we're, we're a little bit more information in terms of, you know, where we're looking to position, what we're trying to do, what are our end goals with, with this, the value that we're looking to create in Eden Brew. We've all seen certainly other startups, you know, we've just seen um, Perfect Day last year do a raise on a capital valuation of $1.5 billion. You know, if we sort of sit there and, you know, us as a, you know, we are a small um, farmer cooperative, I mean, we were the largest, but, uh, and probably the last operating. You know, if we were able to create that kind of value within, within Eden Brew, and, you know, we're, we're a significant shareholder in that value, that can only be positive for us and our business and our farmers, and, and then provides us with a significant amount of, of scope, room, capability, balance sheet strength to be able to support them when we have, you know, times of poor weather, which we, which we know that unfortunately in our country we've seen, we've just seen obviously floods and before that droughts, etc. And personally, I mean, you two are coming from completely different walks of life too. I mean, again, let's put the, the Eden Brew story out, but coming from a, a background in supermarkets, you know, and coming from that, that position of really, you know, the supermarket and, and, and the cost and, and setting that price. So how do you navigate that and how has that added value to Eden Brew? Well, I think, yeah, Michael and I have got a, a, a bit of history where um, you know, I was on one side of the desk and he was on the other. And there was Michael a, just looked like that, looked like a bit of an understatement when you said a bit of history. Oh, I, mean, I, just... I, I think if you just let me start on this one, I mean, I think there'll be people in the room that would understand the certain personal motivation that would that comes across if, you know, you've always been sitting on the other side of the desk of a general manager in buying in a major supermarket and all of a sudden you get to be his boss sitting on the board. <laughs> like, there was a fair po personal motivation in that one, so... Um, oh, Michael, yeah, and that, you, were, you were bossing me around when you were supplying to me, don't worry about that. Oh, it, was always, it was always about creating value and that's what I liked about our uh, relationship, Jim, but just not so much how much of that value you wanted to keep for yourself. But anyway, that's a different story. <laughs> Um, but, like, it is, it, is, it is unique. I mean, I think Jim and I did form a relationship um, in, you know, when I was on one side of the desk and he was on the other, and it was all about creating value. And we, and we, we laugh and joke about how much value that Jim wanted to keep for himself, and I'll keep reminding him about that, but, and that's okay. <laughs> but, you know, you're different shareholders, and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, sometimes you still lose, but um, even when you thought you win. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was always about addressing a market what does a consumer want? How do we actually package up a product that's going to be for that particular consumer and how do we get it to them? And then we have the conversation and dance around what that, what that looks like, which we had, we had quite a few of those, of course, hence why I'm, I'm really enjoying my board seat at the moment. <laughs> and, and Jim, I mean, also like this is a reflection on collaboration, yeah, because yeah. there's a lot of talk. Collaboration's a buzzword. But like in this, you're not the smartest person in the room all the time. So in fact, you're, you've surrounded yourself with really smart players, Syro, Norco, and others. 
what does that mean? Well, well, I'm not the smartest person in the room any of the time. So, um, no, I think that uh, it is amazing when you get uh, really disparate but complementary strengths around a complex challenge. And I, I find that innovation really then is about enabling the strengths on those people to come together. Um, so uh, I, I find that this challenge is mostly about just understanding how we all work together. Uh, and we get, as Michael just articulated, that objective view of customers or trends or opportunity uh, and how we, we, we collaborate around um, uh, bringing that to life, realising that value. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very simple and principled process when you break it down like that. So you gave us a little bit of a snapshot about the innovation behind Eden Brew right up front and, and that excellent work from Syro. But let's talk about like then what is the product like? I mean, surely taste is going to be important. What else? Well, there's... There's two main reasons why, of many, but two main reasons why people would, would buy dairy. One is sensory and the other is nutrition. And, and dairy uh, nourishes us like few other foods on the planet. Um, there are three reasons why people would look to avoid dairy. There will be an intolerance perhaps to, to lactose. Uh, there will be concern about uh, environment or animal welfare. So the product that we make really ticks all five boxes. The two reasons why you would consume dairy are the three reasons why you would avoid. Uh, so we're kind of like you can have your milk and avoid it too. And what we know is that um, many milk drinkers are buying other products as well. So it isn't uncommon in this day and age for there to be a milk and a plant-based milk in, in a fridge or maybe two or three different milks because you've got high maintenance teenagers and, and uh, opinionated consumers with, uh, with their different opinions under the one roof. So we see this as very complementary and we see it as a way of addressing many different customers' needs. Uh, but what ultimately will break um, the success down uh, for Eden Brew is being able to nail some really core cool principles around the sensory uh, matching dairy the delivery of nutrition being far superior to plant-based, uh, and then having a very savvy uh, environmental story about, around the way it's produced. Also, you've, you've said a number of times that being co-founded with the leaders of the dairy industry is, is really crucial for you. And, and why is that? Well, I, I like the idea that we are an example of how the dairy industry is innovating to continue to push its sustainability efforts. Um, it's always been a focus within the dairy industry, and we're just an example uh, of how that's expressing itself with, with available technology. So uh, we like that. We like that positioning. But also I like the fact that uh, my go-to-market strategy is, is in place in as much as uh, you know, we will brew the protein centrally and we will take that to Norco who will blend it up with, uh, with the other ingredients and then treat it as if it was raw milk collected from a dairy farm. So they put it down their same bottling plant, it goes into their same filling machine and onto their same refrigerated trucks. Uh, so it really amplifies and de-risks our go-to-market strategy. The Norco's ice cream makers will make our ice cream. Uh, so we, we see that we're jobs for the industry. We're leveraging existing people and infrastructure and technology um, and amplifying it uh, and, and playing to the strengths of the dairy industry. And I think that's a huge resource for Eden Brew. And so Eden Brew then becomes Norco's non-dairy vi uh, division. division, perhaps? Correct, yeah. yeah. But also for Norco, this is a $2 trillion market, potentially. So... I mean, from, from your end now, how do you now, how do you now see this playing out? I think there's a couple of, there's a couple of uh, I guess, just clear, easy sort of pathways in relation to that. There's our existing supply chains, our existing routes to market, and the, the addressable consumer that is of today. And, and I think the product that, that the Eden Brew team have got is going to do an incredibly good job of, of doing that. And it's backed up by science. The nutritional value is there. I think that's an incredibly important part. I mean, as we all know, dairy is, is very nutritional. It's got a high nutritional value to it. And, and certainly some of the other plant-based milks are, are, are far from that. And, and again, there's, it's a lot of, lot of value in those particular segments. We then look a lot more broader to where dairy proteins or proteins uh, are used in the manufacture of other foods around the world. You know, protein and dairy protein is used very much as a binding agent in a whole range of different processed foods across across the world. You know, how can we how can we augment the supply chain of those and then have 
you know, Eden Brew proteins that are made in your biscuits and made in cakes and made in a whole range of other products that are, again, developed from Australian science and then, again, going back to help Australian farmers, albeit in a market that they might not be able to address as of today. And, and I think the scale and the opportunity of, of, of that is, is incredibly important. Um, you know, in, farming in Australia is, is, is difficult and we need to do whatever we can in terms of being able to help provide more value back to the farmer. And, you know, as again, as a 100% farmer-owned cooperative, that's our sole purpose and mission and we, we think about that every single day of the week. And if we've got Eden Brew in our business doing 20, 30, 40, 50 million litres of volume, whether or not that's coming into a domestic market or that's going overseas, well, that's going through our factories. And that all of a sudden has some, you know, as I said before, some significant consequences for our cost, which then means, you know, very good outcomes for, for our farmers, and not, notwithstanding the value of the investment. You know, we all see the, the amount of money globally that's being poured into uh, ag tech investments, food security, et cetera, which Eden Brew fits all those boxes as well. So, you know, again, I think there's, there's a multi-pronged value stream here for our, for our members as we look to the future and, the, and what prospects Eden Brew has. I mean, I was having fun about the members earlier on, but really, you'll lose a lot of credibility as a dairy guy if this product comes out and it doesn't taste like milk. So talk to me about that at the moment. Like, how do you make sure this is an uncompromised dairy experience? That's what the promise is. And, and, mm. and how is that being tested? And, and first to you, and then we can get into it. But I mean, really, like, your credibility will hang on this, surely. Yeah, I, th I think that's it's, it's a good point. My credibility, I guess, sits on a lot of things, by the way, that I do, and, and, and those those articles of the ABC sort of a testament to that. But I, I think, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work that's gone in in the flavour development of, of the Eden Brew product. There's been, you know, certainly developments and improvements, and we're not finished yet. Um, we've, we've just shipped a, a number of samples, or last year shipped a number of samples around the world for other people to, to test as well, which was which was great. I had it in the fridge at home and, and um, you know, my wife had it and she said, oh, I really like that, Michael. <laughs> you know, and I was nearly, nearly ringing for the lawyers straight away there. But um, anyway, um, you know, it is a good product. Like it's, if you're a, if you're a plant based milk drinker and you're, you're drinking soy milk or you're drinking almond milk at the moment, like the, the sensory experience is just miles apart. Like absolutely miles apart. So you're feeling apart. this is close from your end or you've, you've hit the nail right on the head? You feel like it's Uncompromised? Where are you at with it? Oh, I would say at the moment where it is 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 exceptionally good, but I think where we want to be is we want it to be absolutely outstanding, and I think there'll be a, a few other tweaks that that the product development team will make to it to make it even better than what it is today. But certainly, um, as the product comes to market, it'll be you know highly highly nu nutritional product again. Jim mentioned the, the, the two reasons for and the three reasons against, you know, this will be solving for, for, for those, which is incredibly important. And, and indeed, it'll, it'll deliver on a milk texture, a milk um, feel, the nutritional value, taste, you know, in all sense and purposes, it'll, it'll, feel, it'll feel like milk. And Jim, are you sick of testing glasses of milk or where are you at with it right now? No, no, I, I don't think I'll ever get sick of it. It's, it's, uh, it's such an exciting thing when you create the product and you know all the theory suggests this is what it'll taste like, but then you taste it and you go, well, it is. Um, so we've got, we've got a few fun internal videos where we, we tried product for the first time in the CSIRO um, manufacturing uh, plant down in Werribee in, in, in Victoria. And um, yeah, was, we had a whole crowd there and you know, drunk and said, oh my God, it's ready for sale already. Uh, it was, it's incredible. But there's been a lot of work around analysing flavours and odours of milk, characterising them very technically and then going and finding natural um, compounds that, that uh, add up to recipe up the flavour. So we're very confident that uh, we'll pass a blind taste test when the product comes to market. And right now we're focusing this calendar year on scaling manufacturing so that we can make a damn lot of it. And once we've scaled up the science, you then tinker with the final formulation. So we, we've, we've progressed it far enough now that it's proof of concept and we've sent it around the world to collaborators, investors and the like. And um, we're very proud of how close it is already. Well, let's also set the scene and like, how does this play out over the next six, 12, 18 months? Like, when do we see products in market? What is that plan? So um, the, the process to get 
foods like this to market is to apply to Fazans, Food Standards Australia New Zealand, uh, and we would forecast nine to 12 months approval process and we're lodging imminently. So uh, our intention is to launch ice cream the tail end of summer next year. Um, it's easier to make ice cream in that you need uh, less proteins than when you when you make milk. So kind of we're ready with ice cream whilst we're, we're building up to milk, which is our, our main play, if you like. So launching ice cream, tail end of summer next year, and about six months after that, so mid to late next year, we'll launch milk. And when am I going to get to test the ice cream? That's what I'm, I'm interested in. Well, I will be doing some pretty good batches <laughs> late this year, so I'll yeah. look you up. Don't you worry right. about that. It's like my one weakness. <laughs> Nine o'clock every night. Not always with sprinkles, though, just sometimes. <laughs> so, I mean, Eden Brew then has the potential to create significant value. Like, and this is in a way that we normally don't see in traditional agriculture. And I'm wondering, because, you know, also not just with your connection with dairy, but you have had a strong sense with numbers and, and, and doing deals over the years. What would it mean if Eden Brew becomes a $500 million org or, or, or and it continues to grow? Like, what does that look like that trajectory mm. i think um you know the the potential valuations of the Edinburgh organization as a, as a whole ecosystem when we when that's combined with the precision fermentation i mean you see some of the numbers that are going around at the moment and they are monopoly numbers uh you you see a lot of you see a lot of dairy companies at the moment you know one was just traded on a six multiple um of ebitda you know, investments in um, in this structure, the the multiples are infinite at the moment because they're still not at um, not at an EBITDA positive level at the moment, and there's there's companies with 1.5 billion dollar valuation. So, you know that's that's a that's an incredible amount of, of, of value that can be created. And if I look at the enterprise value of our organisation, that might be 250 million dollars. Let's just say, and not saying that is, but let's say that as an example. You know, as, as Eden Brew grows, and you know, we've again we've got a 25% interest in the Eden Brew business. You know, there's there's a whole lot of opportunity there to create a lot more enterprise value out of the uh, the investment and the pathway through this deep tech being commercialised on a global scale from Australia, which is I think is incredibly important. And that value coming back to again to help to help farmers in Australia, and particularly our our, our dairy cooperative members. So. So, you know, from our perspective, you know, we, we see the sky's the limit and Jim, get on with it. Um, you know, we're certainly, we're certainly keen to, to see that value be created and, and to be captured, captured for us, captured for, you know, Australia as a nation and, and not uh, overseas, which I, which I think is important because this is going to be done. Mm. Someone's going to do this. Someone's going to crack that. It's whether or not you want to be bold and brave enough to say that I want to, I actually want to capture that for our region, for our country, for our farmers, for our future and, and ongoing economic prosperity for wherever these, wherever the production is based, wherever the, um, whether that's in New South Wales, in Queensland or in, or in Victoria, like how do we capture that economic value for us as a country and not see that passed on to some other, other land? And what I love about this story and, and, and having read it up now and, and learning about the company, this is also not about you know, in quotation marks, the dairy industry being shit, mm. is it? It's not about um, everything needs to just suddenly stop and change, but it is acknowledging that diet changes will um, lead to a need for more protein. We need to see double that in the next 30 years. Um, but also we're facing some real challenges as well. So, I mean, when you consider all of that, how, how important is that in the Eden Brew story? Because it seems like it, it, it is a thread there. This is about also not wanting to alienate the dairy industry, yeah. but we do also need some sustainable models. So, like, how do you balance that? Yeah, well, I, I think it's, it's, it's fundamental to our story. I mean, the, the real driver behind Eden Brew here is not to make cows redundant, right? What the driver here is that if you look at reports like the Eat Lancet report, which is maybe six years old now, um, commissioned by the World Health Organization, institutes like the Resources in, uh, World Resources Institute, they're all studying how economies are getting more wealthy around the world. And when GDP per capita goes up, and, uh, and citizens have more wealth, their consumption choices change. And so what that means really predominantly in Asia is that um, there will be a much greater demand for protein as 
people choose to eat different foods to what they eat today. So there'll be more steaks and more lattes and more cheeses um, on, day, on tables, displacing perhaps rice and vegetables at the moment. Now, um, we have never, as a food system, faced in a 30-year period um, a, a doubling, a forecast doubling of protein demand. And so we, we absolutely must find uh, new and innovative and resource savvy ways to meet that demand uh, because you don't have two planets to feed the world's population and 30 years is no time at all. So um, this is absolutely about augmenting supply, um, being, being able to scale an industry significantly in a, in a really resource savvy way. And Michael, the mission of Edinburgh is audacious, which is really to make sustainable milk for the world. But I think that you've actually kind of got quite a positive bounce in your step around what that means beyond the here and now. So take us forward. What excites you about this work? What, what, what do you see in the future? Well, I, I certainly see a situation where, you know, as a, we're 100% farm-run cooperative. We have 200 dairy farms that, that, that supply us milk. I think there's an exciting opportunity for them and other farmers, obviously, to, to see the value in, in what this looks like and, and to capture some of that value for themselves. Uh, we're, we're at the moment, and certainly with our footprint, you know, we, we can't capitalise on, on massive global offshore markets, um, but we can buy Eden Brew. You know, we can you know, basically make proteins, 100% um, protein. You think about a lot of the exports out of, out of various dairy in, um, countries, a lot of that's exported in skim milk powder at 32, 33% protein. So that automatically, it's being dried and put into bags at um, one third of the efficiency of what our proteins would be at 100%. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a whole amount of scale that we'll be able to bring um, to various parts of the industry. And as we look at, we look at Australia too, the amount, of, the amount of dairy product that we're exporting is getting less and less and less as the milk pool is, is, is shrinking. So can we augment that to say, well, instead of spray dryers spray drying um, normal skim milk, how about they spray dry some of these powders and we can continue on, you know, Australia as, an organ, as, a, as a country, continue that export pro process on dairy protein so that, you know, other organisations across the world that rely on, on, on dairy proteins in their food manufacture don't augment to something else. Because if they augment to something else, we'll probably lose them from dairy forever. So, you know, and that's not going to happen today, it's not going to happen tomorrow, won't happen in the next few years, but, you know, if we continue our decline in the milk pool and, you know, there's a whole lot of reasons that we think that that might continue and there's a whole lot of things we're going to do to make sure that it doesn't, of course, but if it, but if it does, we want to be able to make sure that we can still keep that economic activity through, you know, a, again, dairy plants. Imagine if at the, at, at the moment we have a lot of dairy plants that are shutting down in this country, which is quite sad for the industry. But can we augment the, the, the capacity in those particular plants to, to provide an extra 10, 15, 20,000 tonnes of output in those factories so that they can again provide um, a cheaper cost structure for, for the, the, the processor to, to then you know, provide better milk prices to their farmers? I mean, all those things are, are, are quite significant possibilities, but we've got to obviously open our minds up to that, that that's the kind of pathway that we'd want to get to. And briefly, what if it fails? Well, if it, if it fails, it fails. I mean, there'll be a few uncomfortable conversations <laughs> with the CEO sitting next to me, but, um, you know, we don't think it will. But, you know, in the end, if it, if it doesn't play out the way we said, what, what, what's the fallout for Norco? Well, the fallout for Norco is that we've been on a change journey in our business for the last three and a half to four years, which has been significant, and we've certainly um, made a significant amount of change in our organisation. One of the positive things which which if this was the only benefit, I still think it'd be worthwhile, is, is bringing in a startup culture into a 127-year-old company. So, you know, and, and a very traditional organisation, a lovely organisation, I care deeply about it, but, it, but again, you know, a, an older organisation becomes set in its ways. We've been doing this for the last 25 or 30 years. Michael, it can't change. You know, those kind of, those kind of conversations always prick up the monitor ears and sort of make me, oh, I've got to go, got to go back to that. But bringing the startup culture into an older, established, uh, more traditional organisation was an absolute godsend benefit. What has that enabled us to do? Well, it's enabled us to change a culture from we can't do things wrong, we've got to get it always right, to 
all right, well, if we fail on a few things, that's okay. What are we going to learn about it? Let's fail fast and cheap, make some adjustments and try again. And also the pace that a, that a startup business operates in. You know, we're starting, you know, whether it's Jim, you know, he's got, he's got a runway of cash that he's got to spend and he, he's, he's got to get the outcomes that, that, um, that, that we expect out of that. You know, getting that kind of level of urgency commitment, you know, through into our organisation has been fantastic on a whole range of fronts in terms of, you know, speed to market of other innovation products, critical thinking, um, and, and again, thinking outside of the box for different solutions might not necessarily have been product development, but that whole change in culture in the organisation, you know, I certainly see the, the, the time that our people have been able to spend with Jim and the team and the, and the science crew at, at, at Syrah, and indeed that pace, that hum, that, you know, we're really striving for that goal and outcome and, and, and common vision, I think, I think it's been incredibly value, valuable for our organisation. But it's not going to fail, Jim, so that's it's, okay. It can't. We've uh, passed that point. <laughs> no. And we know that dairy is like the nutrition of life and there is, I mean, there's so much that dairy can do and, and, and can contribute. So there is a bigger long-term play as well. So can you for a moment imagine what does this mean on a global scale and, and, and what could be possible in the future with this innovation? Yeah, certainly, the way we are brewing proteins is a technology platform. So we're a, we're a technology company in food, and that technology can be deployed across many ingredients. Uh, and we see ourselves in the future doing some really cool things like designing out the allergenicity in dairy proteins or curating types of milk for sectors of the community. So um, elderly might drink um, an osteoporosis avoidance blend, uh, you know, just trying to come up with a simple idea. I think there's, there's lots of different ways that we can look at specific needs of sectors of the community and curate a nutritional profile far more targeted to them. And that's where I think a lot of food is going. It's going around personalisation and it's going around people wanting to understand their own health and what their own needs are and then selecting um, foods that meet those needs. So we, we have, I think, uh, an unbridled amount of uh, R&D that we want to run to. We're limited by imagination here and the technology platform that underlines how we're bringing this milk to market enables so much. We're going to open up to some questions. We've maybe we can take maybe two to three questions. We've got some microphones here, and if you have, have, have a question, you can quickly put up your hand, and we can get a microphone to you. Yes, we've got one over here. So if you want to quickly, we'll get this microphone here, and maybe if we can have one more standing by over here, that would be great. Uh, yeah, uh, great uh, discussion. I just wanted to know what is the cost per liter of equivalent milk. We are going to launch uh, with a cost of about $4 uh, by the end of next year. And by about 2028, uh, we'll be the same price as dairy milk on the shelf. There's two drivers that get the cost from $4 down to about $1.50. Um, one is fermenting in larger scales. So it's about two thirds of the reduction is accessing larger breweries and one third is getting better at brewing. So we're rushing to get a product to market and we'll be reasonably good at fermenting, but then we'll keep working on how to optimise and run those fermentations to get more proteins for the same effort. So you get a, a bit of cost price improvement over time through just getting better at it. So two thirds is about scale and one third's about just being better at brewing. But ultimately by 2030, we believe you'll walk into a supermarket, you'll know it tastes the same, you'll trust the nutrition, you'll understand the product, and it'll be the same price. Looking for a couple, yes, over here, number three, thank you. Thank you. Really interesting talk. I'm just wondering, dairy farms are cropping to feed cattle. Will these farms be growing the crops that are the raw ingredients for fermenters? That's a great question. Um, and the short answer to that is yes. So uh, I expect we'll use a lot of sugar uh, as, as a core feedstock into our, our process. But I think that um, as we build food breweries around the world, and there will be a lot of food made this way, uh, not just in dairy, across all categories um, in the years to come, there will be a match between the the the, the the yeast or the strain that is doing the fermenting and what you feed it. And so there's going to be a need for us to develop a whole heap of kind of uh, different feedstock and fermentation matches so that when we brew in different locations, whatever the feedstock is in that region, uh, we, can, we can deploy. Got a question down here. Hi. 
and win here. So if I hope the $4 is not the cost of production, I think it is a market entry price. And why don't take a Tesla model, like go for a high value. There are, if you can do fermentation for, there are multiple proteins you can ferment for, like which are in need. It's not like just for the sake of it. Yes. Why don't you go for that kind of a model? And then once you're ready with your price, then go for dairy because there are too many alternates at the moment. Yeah, look, we, we've, we've had that debate internally and it's a really good question. And I think you know, life's about choices. Uh, and the choice we're making here is we want to make as big an impact as we can, as quickly as we can. And we only have 30 years to meet a 100% increase in demand for protein. We need to be working on it. Uh, I guess we justify it to ourselves that if we can make milk, we can make anything because uh, it's got more proteins than other products and less uh, I guess, opportunity in terms of margin or, or cost uh, to the final consumer. So once we've nailed milk, everything else is, is uh, a lot easier. So we started this business out to scale it, to scale it really large and really quickly, uh, and those cost benefits will flow in. I'd say think of us a little bit like Coca-Cola in our supply chain, where um, Coke would make their syrup centrally and then partner with carbonators around the world to put the water, the bubbles and the brand on. Um, we will brew those proteins centrally to get to lowest cost and then partner with uh, dairy companies around the world to, to, to recombine and, and market our brand in their geography. Um, Norco is going to uh, be our key go to market here and it'll be a good example of relationships we can strike in other geographies to get that scale. <coughs> and I wouldn't mind just adding to that too, if that's, a, if that's okay, Bryce. I mean, it, being in the dairy industry, I mean, I've, I've seen some really silly things where value has been created and we've just given it away, i.e. negotiations on cheese contracts where $40 million had just been wiped out of the dairy industry and gone to a retailer's pocket. I mean, if we're establishing a market at a particular price that, that shows, shows value and growth, I mean, the, why you would look to reduce the value of that, I've got... I've got no idea, I don't, I, and I don't think that was the question and the answer, but, but I think if, you know, there's, we're going to create a, an, an, an enormous amount of value on this, so I, I don't think we'd diminish that over a particular point in time. I think we'd be looked to enhance and grow it, and, and scale will come from a whole lot of off, offshore in, uh, international ingredient consumptions, et cetera, et cetera, and people doing similar things that we're doing in terms of Norco being, you know, the, the blender distributor in all different parts of the world. Mike Fall. Great. And then we'll probably have one more question. Thank you. My question is, how important has the cooperative structure been to enabling this innovative mindset of the dairy farmers in particular? It's interesting. There's, there's not too many of us left. Um, I, 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 on, on reflection, uh, I think the... I think the biggest part of this has been being able to to be able to tell a story and 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 get a board aligned to what the benefits are going to be for its members. Uh, again, it's, a, it's certainly a bit of a leap of faith from them and and, and courage in what we were, what we're attempting to do. Uh, and and I guess that that 100% focus on trying to do the right thing for for our farmers, which I think is you know that's what we do every day. It's part of our DNA. It's a conversation we have with our people every day. And I think that probably served us to say, well, how can we provide more value for our farmers? You know, not value to Collins Street or offshore investors or making one family rich. It's about how do we create a whole lot of value and being able to provide that back to our members. And that, and that certainly is, well, that's our mission, but that's certainly been part of it. Is a cooperative structure um, something that's, that's led to that outcome? Maybe, maybe because... You know, we, were, we, did, we do have a, a fairly blinding view on trying to make the lives of our farmers the best as they possibly can be, and we do see this as, as one way that we can do that. We have one final question from number three. Uh, thank you. Um, how do you see the, the, the narrative and the, the marketing of cow milk evolving over the next 30 years as, you know, the market expands for fermented milk? I think that's very, very important, and, and, and it's a great question. I mean, we've just commissioned a, a national farmer wellbeing study, which um, closed last week, and we've seen some some interesting results come out of that. And one of the um, one of the interesting results has come out is that farmers don't feel valued for their product as much as what they used to. You know, I remember when I was a kid, my dad used to always say to me, you know. 
This country is built on the back of the sheep's back, son, and we've got to make sure all the farmers are doing well. And if the farmers aren't doing well, we're not going to do well. And I think we've got to get back to that. And that's, um, and that's an important part of how I think any kind of marketing strategy needs to, needs to move forward. You know, certainly our product, we're 100% farm-owned. The business is owned by, owned by farmers. People will want to support farmers. And as an industry and broader industries, not just the dairy industry, we need to get back in there and say that we're here for the farmer. We want you to support our product because we're supporting farmers. And do it properly, do it authentically, not just because it's a flashy sign on a commercial. Like, do it, have it as your entire purpose of, as what drives your organisation. And that's going to be the, you know, the genuineness that consumers will look to, look to um, you know, really gravitate to as we go through into a market which even at the moment is reasonably saturated with different options. And we've all heard the commercials from before, I just want milk to taste like real milk because there's all these different options. You know, those are the kind of things that certainly I think are going to stand out into the future and, and certainly put our farmers in good stead. Michael Hampson, Jim Fader, this is going to be a very interesting story for us to follow. I can't wait to try Eden Brew ice cream <laughs> with my sprinkles at 9 o'clock at night when I do it. <laughs> uh, but for now, really thanks for being part of Evoke Ag. 